Well, uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Mike Higton. I'm from uh, Durham University and I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to this new Power in the Church of England uh, webinar series. This is the, the first event in what we hope will be an ongoing series. Um, it's organised in part by the Michael Ramsey Centre for Anglican Studies at, at Durham University and also by the Department of Politics, Philosophy and Religion at Lancaster University. Uh, but I'm not introducing things on my own. Um, my colleague Anderson, uh, over to you for the next bit. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm really delighted that uh, this has come to fruition after much deliberation. So uh, I'm Anderson Jeremiah and I'm based in Lancaster. Uh, I lecture in the Department of um, Politics, Philosophy and Religion uh, with, with special interest within the uh, Anglican Church. Uh, so what, uh, what we hope to do through this series of webinars is to kind of explore um, one of the very often overlooked um, issue. It's very often in a kind of uh, elephant in the room, but none of us would like to really talk about it because either we are invested in it or we are kind of trying to uh, stand away from it. Uh, so there are many forms of power uh, that shape the life of the church uh, with, with specific reference to Church of England. And the ways in which these forms of power um, shape people's experience uh, in and around uh, the church um, and also try to address how um, these various accounts of power, both theological, sociological, and also kind of um, uh, various ecclesiological uh, perspectives can be uh, examined. And, and also not necessarily approach this from a negative um, stance, but rather try and engage with it, uh, how healthily power can be exercised and understood, and um, in many ways kind of uh, can be a good uh, a channel for good and common good as we very often articulate. And also um, not to shy away from the reality of how the misuse and abuse of power within the church has been um, such a bane of our, many of our uh, experiences. So the, the primary idea for us is that we Mike and the small steering group that we uh, will hopefully be introduced is that, that we will create a, a space, a platform for having honest, open conversations and also hear different voices and different perspectives in the space uh, and, uh, and also uh, engage in this conversation with respect and dignity and also regard for one another in how we understand and come and participate in the life of the church. Over to Mike. Thank you, Anderson. Um, you'll be pleased to see that Mark Tanner has in fact bought the elephants in the room. With... <laughs> um, uh, just to say that, that um, Anderson and I are two members of a small steering group um, who are putting these webinars together, um, who you'll meet over time if you come back to more of, of the webinars. Um, Stephanie Barrett, Francis Clemson, Liz Graveling, who you'll see in a minute, and Anderson, Katie Tupling, and, and, and me. Um, we will, uh, wherever we can, um, we'll, uh, be putting up recordings of the webinars and making those publicly uh, available. I just should say also that we're open to uh, proposals for future sessions. We've got quite a few lined up and proposals for more, but we're open to proposals for more sessions further down the line and for doing things in different formats. This one's a, a panel discussion. Some of the ones we've got lined up are, are interviews, others more like sort of individual paper presentations. We're open to experiment in that kind of way. So please do get in touch with me or with Anderson or with anyone in the steering group if you have an idea. But I think that's enough by way of introductions from me. I'm now going to hand over to uh, Liz Graveling who's going to introduce this particular session. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Anderson. And let me add my welcome to everybody. And um, thank you for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm Liz Graveling. I'm uh, based in the national ministry team of the Church of England. And I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with three fabulous people. And um, we have Francis Ward, who is a theologian, a parish priest and the former Dean of St. Edmundsbury. Um, Julius Anosier, 
who is a curate in uh, Derby Diocese and the secretary to the UKME Ordinance and Curates Group, um, and Mark Tanner, who is uh, Bishop of Chester. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a moment. We're all quite different in lots of ways, and we're all um, we're all looking forward to listening to and learning from each other over the next hour. So what we're going to do is I'll invite I'll introduce myself, and then I'll invite each of the panelists to give some initial thoughts on this topic of power over or power with in the Church of England and then we're going to explore it a bit further in conversation um, and there'll be a time for questions uh, towards the end which you'll be able to submit through the chat function but please don't um, if, if, if I can ask you not to use the chat function until until then there'll be about 10-15 minutes towards the end to do that but but if I ask you not to use the chat until then because it gets um, quite distracting thank you so um yeah so I uh, as I said, I'm based in the Church of England uh, National Ministry Team, and my role there is to, to advise on and to do uh, research. And the research, the main project that I've been working on over the past few years is called Living Ministry. It's all about uh, clergy well-being and what can help clergy to flourish in their ministry. So, so um, focus on ordained ministry this afternoon. Um, and in the recent wave of that research, it's longitudinal over a period of 10 years, and in the re a recent wave, we've been focusing on the experiences of clergy in transition periods through in ordained ministry. Um, so transitioning between different stages and different roles. And that has thrown up quite a lot of questions about power and powerlessness. So especially during those transitions, and especially the transitions into and out of curacy. Um, so I suppose for me this afternoon, I'm, I'm here really seeking to represent the voices of the participants in that research and also to listen to and understand um, the perspectives of, of others. But of course, within that, as well as within this virtual room, there are all sorts of power dynamics present. And I think it's important to, to recognize that, especially as we're talking about, about power. Um, so, you know, as a researcher, I can, I can only represent the voices of other people through my own particular lens, which is the lens of um, a straight, white, middle class woman uh, working in the national church with my own history and family history of associations with the Church of England. Um, importantly as well, I'm a lay person speaking here with clergy about clergy. Um, so in my role as a researcher, I mediate the stories of others. And actually, we all do that, don't we, whatever our role. So one thing I would invite you all, everyone who's attending this webinar and the whole series of webinars to do is to reflect and to keep on reflecting on your own positionality. So how you might be interpreting what you hear and what will be influencing that. I think that's really important as we approach any angle um, to do with power. Um, one thing I didn't mention about myself is that uh, I have a background, my academic background is in development studies, and that also um, gives particular perspectives on power. Um, and one example of that is the model on which the title of this webinar is based. It comes from um, a model uh, of power and um, that's been explored by uh, Veniklausen and Miller. You can find it if you look up a new weave of power, you can find more about it. And it's, it's um, they, they set out four uh, expressions of power, they call them. So there's power over, which is all about authority and control, uh, domination, coercion. So powerful people having power over powerless people. Um, Power two, which is about uh, the ability and the awareness of one's ability to act. Um, so about having skills and knowledge and tools about affecting change. Um, then there's power with, which is about collective action and agency and building shared understandings. Uh, and then they talk about power within, which is awareness of our situation and of the possibility to change it. So it's about having confidence, dignity, self-esteem. It's that kind of arena. Um, actually, Robert Chambers adds um, a, a fifth expression of power, which is the power, which is power to empower. Um, so, so power to give other people power to do things, power within. Um, and interesting, it's, it's, it was really interesting looking at the, the narratives of the, the, the research participants through this kind of lens of different expressions of power. Um, as they discussed their own well-being, and, and remember, they were, this is what they were talking about. They were talking about well-being. 
um, they articulated a lot of experiences of power as power over. So where they were in the position of feeling largely powerless, while others, um, often referred to as the diocese or the bishop, um, held power over them. And, and there was a lot of anxiety and distrust um, kind of articulated within the narratives of the research participants. There were also um, some accounts of power to, so able to, to do things to change the situation, power within, which was sometimes articulated in terms of faith, um, and of power to empower or to disempower, particularly um, in relation to bishops having that power to, to empower people. Um, but there were few examples of power with so beyond the kind of local or tradition based uh, support networks or collaboration with colleagues or parishioners, there, there were what, what wasn't so evident was were examples of power with in the sense of shared understanding between people at different levels of church hierarchy. So what I'm interested in um, is how can we move away from a culture within the church where power is understood and experienced predominantly as power over and with all the anxiety, all the distrust um, that comes with that. Is it possible or is it even desirable to move towards a culture where power with becomes the norm? What would that look like and what would it take to get there? Those are some of the questions that I'm bringing this afternoon. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Frankie now and then Julius and Mark. Thanks, Liz. Um, I, I come to this panel having been a priest in the Church of England for over uh, 30, well, since 94, since women were first ordained. And, and all the way through, questions of power and gender have been very much sort of there and shaping me and also, as I became more senior and ended up a dean, um, also something that I found myself handling with varying degrees of, um, of wisdom, I, I guess. And, and I suppose um, the thing that really has struck me more than anything is that power can be seen as oppositional. It can be seen as something that I've got and you haven't, or they've got and I haven't. And, and it divides us into people who have and those who have not. And I guess that's a trajectory can go back to Hegel's master and slave or through Nietzsche and Foucault and various other ways of seeing things with a sort of critical theory sort of framing. But I've come to question that, I think, and because I, I think that it forces binaries on us and it instills a hermeneutic of suspicion from the word go um, of those who have position power. And I, I just think that a lot of how we think about power can be to do with the way we frame the frame we, the way we frame the understanding that we're having. So I think increasingly um, I'm sort of asking questions about power and agency so that power is no longer seen in my mind and hopefully in others <laughs> as a possession but as the ability to change circumstances um, and then to judge it on how it's being used and to what end because of course it can be used for selfish gain, uh, for exercising a will to power, or for the common good and for public service. So I think, um, I, I, I increasingly think, well, how is this power being used? Not, not a question so much of who's got it and who hasn't, but what's happening here? Um, but perhaps that's to fall into another binary. So <laughs> there's a question for us. I, I reckon, um, through my experience and looking back and, and checking myself and understanding myself as someone who has power, and I would want to say that we all do, um, it can be exercised with real mixed motives, with good intentions, but less desirable outcomes, with a mixture of good principle and a sense of service, but with a varying degrees of ego thrown in there, which we all have and often don't recognise perhaps as we should. And then even with the best motives, the outcomes of the exercise of the power can be very mixed with unforeseen consequences that can hurt, cause hurt and damage where repentance, recompense, retribution, forgiveness become necessary. For no one, I would want to say, exercising power and agency with good intention is perfect. We all make mistakes. And I know, I know mine, <laughs> well, uh, many of them, many that, that I don't know. Do we live in a world where trust predominates, um, 
even when suspicion is also necessary, where trust and forgiveness trump suspicion and grievance. So uh, my first point would be power is not a possession, but an agency for good or ill, but always mixed. Then I want to think about power and how it's exercised and use the word arbitrary. Um, is the power being used in an arbitrary way? By which I mean, is it, does it have due checks, both internal and external to its exercise? And the internal checks might look a bit like the questions we might ask, are my motivations good? What wisdom and principles am I bringing to the circumstances in which I find myself? Am I working towards the common good with a spirit that puts service over self? How can I work with others who bring their own agency and power to reform a situation that we find ourselves in? So they might be the internal checks that we would, we would ask of ourselves. And then there's external checks as well, which, which are, are much more to do with the governance, um, the constitution, the institution, the associations that we belong to and the governance that belongs with those. So in a PCC meeting, you know, are, um, if I'm chairing or if someone else is chairing, are they mindful of how to use the governance to enable the people who don't usually speak to speak up so that there's a, a real sense in which the governance is serving that exercise of power and checking the abuse of it. How can I ensure that those institutions and embodiments, those, those um, embodiments of Christ, if you like, the, the bodies of Christ to which I belong are trustworthy as they need to be? How can the institution or the governance enable agency to be as theologically careful and thoughtful as possible? And to think theologically about power, I go to St. Paul and think to myself about what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. So therefore, in a member alongside other members uh, within a body of Christ, um, where, and picking up on that wonderful passage from 1 Corinthians 12, where St. Paul says, particularly those who are overlooked or ignored or unvoiced, he used the word disreputable, are honoured and empowered in the exercise of their power and agency in turn towards the common good of realising the kingdom of God um, in whatever the particular circumstances are that that particular manifestation of the body of Christ finds itself. And then I would want to say that within a corporate body, there will be some with more expertise, more experience, more wisdom and learning who have earned the recognition and authority because they use their ability and agency for the common good, putting service above self. Such people, I would want to say, deserve trust and a, and a degree of def deference, the uh, deference from others, though no one should relinquish a, a hermeneutic of suspicion in any situation, I would want to say. And the more responsibility, the more suspicion, perhaps, so that always the service of building a trustworthy body or institution that ensures the safety and security of all is foremost. Let our ordered lives confess the beauty of God's peace. I, I, I increasingly like the idea of order as something that enables um, us all to fulfill, align ourselves with God's will ultimately. And what would want to say that any hermeneutic suspicion needs to be in the service of building um, circumstances of trust amongst us. And then the fourth point I'd like to make is really how do we recognize the exercise of arbitrary power, which can take many forms by an individual, a group motivated or manipulated by ideology. Um, and signs of exercise might be a lack of space and time to listen, to talk, to disagree carefully and responsibly in synod, for example, in a meeting or a council or a parliament, the railroading that can happen, or a resort to bullying or coercion, either physical or psychological, which can be exercised by anyone because there is a victim or a bully in each of us. And often people who feel themselves to be victims can be can, can, can um, resort to dominant behaviours. Um, a personality with a will to power um, that we might see of people who take the stage and, and you know, people um, listen to them more than others, but perhaps not as they might or should do with a real sense of, is this person actually being reasonable and um, serving the common good here? Um, and also I think that people who are disruptors can also be people who are exercising arbitrary power, um, disrupting what is good 
for the sake of, of ideological blueprints, a, a, you know, a big idea that that takes hold and and actually um, then and uh, prevents people from from looking at, at the good agency that's happening perhaps just under the surface in our ways which are taken for granted and and not particularly observed. So I think that they're, they're the four things, Liz, that, that I wanted to sort of talk about. And I hope that's hope that's helpful. Thank you. That's great. Thank you so much. There's so much in there. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Julius now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Julius. As been said, um, I was born and raised in Nigeria. I have a background in law and human rights, especially of women and children. Um, most recently, I got ordained um, in Derby, so the anointing is still fresh and new. So, um, yeah, and I just moved into curacy. In terms of uh, theology, I am more drawn to young adults ministry, and uh, not because I'm kind of young in the Church of England, but because that is what fascinates me at the present time. On the composition about power and moving in different positions within the Church of England, as a new curate, it's there's a direct connection with the curate and the bishop, and who unfortunately takes on the name of the diocese. And we know that between the bishop and the curate lies a lot of people, a lot of offices, a lot of agencies that work for the diocese and or for the bishop. And this creates a, a huge para, power dynamics between the curates who is moving and the diocese or the bishop in question. And for somebody like me who crossed from one diocese, the diocese in Europe to Derby, it's almost like I am an orphan in that space because I am no longer in contact with my former DDO as it were and all the clergy and all the people I know are no longer there. Therefore, I have to start creating a new form of relationship and the power dynamics at play, I need to get used to it because I don't know who has power and who doesn't. Uh, because the diocese in Europe is structured in a different way from most dioceses in the Church of England, within England. And so it creates a new power relationship between myself and the people surrounding me and I know this is true for uh, a lot of curates also, in terms of, especially when they move, go across diocese of what is actually happening in those places. And to be honest, there's a lot of power play between the bishop and the curate who is coming into the space because the bishop is, the presence of the bishop is felt, not really seen because their office is quite busy and uh, you don't expect to see them around most times. So for a new curate, I see the bishop and I know the diocese via the IME2 officer or the area dean or the archdeacon or my immediate training incumbent. And that has a lot of things it draws in into the person or the curate who is there trying to understand who they are and where they are. And to be honest, there's another reality of most times we, the new curates, are deemed to know nothing. That can be true in some respects, but at other situations, that is not really true. And sometimes that can give us power and also take power away from us because we can take the idea of, well, they don't expect anything from me. Therefore, I can simply play with that and do what I want in terms of there's that assumption that, oh, they will make mistake, they will learn, let's give them, let's allow them to make mistake, which can actually be a form of power in terms of what I do in parish or within the diocese. But at the same time, sometimes when you actually say, well, no, I actually know this thing and I can do it. Sometimes it looks as if you're trying to put yourself too forward and you might threaten some offices, you might um, pull, step on certain toes. So you become a bit careful. And uh, sometimes it's disempowering, to be honest, of what you can do, but you are deemed not able to do them simply because you are a curate, you are moving, we don't trust you, your level of expertise is not yet fine tuned. 
And, and that plays a lot of, brings a lot of issues into the question. And if I will reflect as somebody from a minority ethnic background, this also comes to play where following all the political tensions we've had in the recent past, sometimes people are careful these days because they don't want to offend you. And that can give you some level of power that even if you make mistakes, people are slow to correct you or to draw your attention to it so that they are not called racist. Therefore, that becomes a power in your hands and you can wield it and do stuff, especially when you know you are wrong. <laughs> and uh, But people are scared to correct you because it might actually, from a third party view, be racist, but maybe you're actually doing something wrong. But on the other hand, which is what we usually see, is where people don't know what to do with you. You might be the only a minority ethnic person in the room. And the idea is, what do we do with this person? It's either they ignore you or they begin to make some assumptions about you. Therefore, you they take away all the power you have, even as a senior clergy person or inhabiting different roles, you are deemed to be the, the different person in the room. Therefore, your suggestions might be not really welcomed or you might be seen with, oh, this doesn't apply here. When we go to your cultural context, we can apply it. So keep your knowledge and your power, but here you have not, no power at all. And, um, and that, like, that moves our minds in, in understanding what actually is going on, um, what gives me power, what takes power away from me is my ethnicity, my age, my gender playing a role in my uh, in my power play with the institution or with the person in charge, what is really going on? And to be honest, all of this plays a role in what is happening. And in trying to understand the idea of power with and power over, uh, it becomes a very deep and complicated, complex material. Because um, uh, take for example, when you when we draw up um, policies or documents concerning young people. And we consult young people and we tell them, thank you very much, you can now go. And we take it to the room and the wise people go and draw up the documents, which at the end of the day might not actually resemble what the young people have said. Therefore, we have taken that power of agency from them and we have seen them as um, representatives rather than participants in what is going on. Therefore, tomorrow there might be issue of participating in the whole picture. And to land my submission, I will only say is um, the clergy, the office of a clergy is the office of a good man, quote and unquote. It demands trust, integrity, honesty, decency of the person inhabiting that role, whether it's the office of the bishop or the archdeacon, dean, area dean, curate, newbies like me, it demands integrity, it demands honesty. And I think that is the only place where power over can be transformed to power with because we will be willing to make ourselves accountable to one another, not minding the color of our shirt or whether we wear a pectoral cross or not. All that matters is we are walking in the vineyard of God, which is the most important thing, I think, when we have conversations about power because at the end, it is the power of God we are working with not us. Thank you, Julius. Thank you so much. Um, Mark, can I hand over to you, please? Thank you, Liz. And firstly, an apology. My internet has gone down, so I'm on a mobile device, which is why I disappeared. It's the problem with having a thick Roman wall just outside your house, I think. So that does mean I've lost my elephants, which were my background deliberately, because today I've had lots of conversations on Zoom which have involved elephants in the room. So it was a deliberate choice today. Anyway, um, with a uh, wise heeding or a heeding to Frankie's wise words about ego, um, we were asked to keep this uh, relatively personal. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a story of four meetings and a free for all, if I may. I'm reminded about going in to do sixth form RE where I was vicar in Ripon, where the RE teacher used to get me in once a year and say, you are a living artifact. So let me tell you a little bit what it feels like uh, to try to exercise responsibility, power responsibly. Sorry, as Matt, can I just say, can you just, 
chill a little. Can you just slow it, like, just relax a little bit? You're talking really, really quick. Oh, that's because I have too many thoughts, Jenna, yeah. sorry. You've had loads of coffee, just chill. <laughs> you went to Sixth Farm, go back a little bit, sorry. Uh, um, when I was a vicar in a parish in Ripon, uh, I used to, to go in to do an RE session once a, t a year, and the RE teacher referred to me as a living artefact, so that's what I'll try to be for you today. So a story of four meetings and a free-for-all. The first meeting is this one. Uh, my friends who are presenting can tell you that one of the first questions I asked was, what do you want me to wear? Because usually when I'm engaged in theological conversations, I would be in an open necked shirt. But actually, our counsel was it was right to be here in purple and a pectoral cross. So who has walked into the room? Let me give you three options. Firstly, is it Mark Tanner, the Wally, who has got many, many things wrong in his life? Secondly, is it one with a little experience, but who is trying to do his best to be, well, to be a disciple, to be a learner, to be a theologian, to be a friend, to be a cleric, one who is fallible, but redeemed? Or thirdly, is it some kind of image of the right reverend prelate, the Lord Bishop of this place, that place, or the other, blah, 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 etc., etc.? Because I live with the reality that in my mind, the person walking into the room is one of the first two, the fallible human being who is trying his best. But I need to recognize that often for others, it's some kind of version of the third that enters the room because of this rather unattractive color of shirt that I am asked to wear. I often reflect with friends that I'm usually either deified or demonized when I walk into the room and neither is healthy either for me or for the other party. So does that mean that you are treating me wrongly or I am behaving wrongly? It's a possibility, of course, but it's not what I am trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that we have a shared responsibility if we want to develop a culture of power that we use together. But I said four meetings, so let me give you a snapshot of the other three. The second meeting took place when I was warden of Cramner Hall, principal, if you like, of the Theological College in Durham. I needed to apologise an to an ordinand for something that had taken place, but I didn't want to embarrass them, so I asked them to step into my study, and as we walked through the door, the ordinand asked what they had done wrong, and I found myself with this huge challenge that I wanted to apologize with dignity, the student's dignity, but they automatically assumed that they were in trouble. And it made me reflect very deeply on the power on the turf that I was inhabiting. Third meeting takes place fairly regularly where I, as a bishop in the church, particularly in a diocese where abuse has taken place, have the privilege, and I don't merely mean that as a word, the genuine privilege of meeting with those who are survivors of clerical abuse in order to listen, to hear, and where desired to apologize. I walk into that room knowing that pretty much anything is acceptable because although Mark Tanner has walked into the room, Actually, the person who has walked into the room is the Bishop of Chester. And whilst Mark Tanner might not be culpable, the bishops of the Church of England hold corporate culpability for all manner of uh, bad behaviour, particularly around clerical abuse in the past. What place do I occupy in that room? And what power should I, can I exercise? Fourth meeting took place just a few weeks ago, but takes place fairly regularly. I turn up as a church in all my bishopy gear, and I am greeted as I wind down my window to park the car with the question, how is young Mark today? And I find myself thinking, I don't know what the correct response to this is. It's not that I want to be touchy, but I've actually turned up as your bishop to preside over an act of worship. And by the way, when you are in your 50s in the real world, you are not young. How then do I respond in a way that does not put the other down? Four meetings and a free for all, which took place some years ago on the United States border with Canada. I turned up driving an American car with a British accent, as you can hear, and a Canadian passport because I was born in Canada. 
the border guard asked me in a very thick North American accent to, and forgive me for my attempt to do an American accent, I can't do one as a Brit or as a Canadian, but to pop the trunk. And I had to ask him to repeat this about four times until I eventually said, oh, you mean open the boot? Anyway, he was very cross with me and had me spread eagled on the car. There were guns everywhere. It was all scary until he tried to suggest that I had a duty to be carrying my UK passport because I lived in the United Kingdom. And I found myself getting very irate really at him saying I have no need even to have a British passport. My first nationality by birth is Canadian and I'm coming from Canada. And I felt that something was trying to be robbed from me, rightly or wrongly, for meetings and a free-for-all. In one meeting that took place some years ago, I was there, I had been already ordained bishop, and I was asked at the end why I had been quiet, unusually quiet, in the meeting. I said, I'm not sure who I am in this room, whether I'm a bishop, a theologian, or a human being. And somebody said to me, that's interesting. I don't think of bishops as human beings. And at one level, that must be okay. But I want to observe three things. Firstly, if we are going to be responsible about power, we need to be hugely cautious of a disconnect between who we are and what we do, our identity and the way that we exercise our power. It's true for bishops, but not only for bishops. Secondly, I want to observe that issues of power are deeply complex, and even in the most binary situations, power will actually be held in many hands. I recognize that I have power as a bishop, although often it's not the power that other people think I have, but we have a complex interwoven culture, and this will be changed with care and deliberateness. And thirdly, I want to note that although I, and I have to say most of my Episcopal colleagues, have a deep desire to work with, we cannot do this alone, especially because there are places where we need to wield power. So it jars with me when discipline issues cross my desk, and I need to exercise power for the good of another, but over a, a different party. I think the world and the church, and indeed I suspect each of you would want me to do that when it comes to matters like safeguarding or other things. But actually holding that complex demand takes great subtlety, takes uh, great, I think, accountability, and is something that we need to work at together. Which is why I'm glad to be here, even if I speak a bit too fast, I apologize again, Jenna, to listen, to learn, to share and in order that we might grow together in this culture. Thank you, Mark. Thank you all for those really um, fascinating and personal, actually, um, introductions to this theme. Um, there's so much there we could pick up on. There were, there were questions to do with um, uh, the personal, the, the individual, uh, and, and the office that, that people hold and the relationship between those things. There were questions to do with um, how much uh, power, issues to do with power are to do with um, us personally and, and our personal responses and, and behaviours and how much they're to do with the structures um, of, of the church and, 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 and um, even society as well around us. Um, there are questions to do with accountability and um, questions to do with expectations as well. I thought what we might start with is something that everyone I think has picked up on, and that's the question um, of agency and also responsibility. And and you've all, we have all, I think, um, mentioned uh, those things. And one thing that uh, I noticed in the the living ministry research was that when I listen to say to curates who don't have much kind of decision making power over things like finances. And often they'll be speaking in a kind of rights-based discourse. So they'll talk about what my rights are and what, um, what, so the parish allows me this, or they're not covering this, and what is your parish covering for you, and what should they be covering, and those kinds of things. Um, when I speak to incumbents, when I listen to incumbents, 
it's a different discourse and it's much more responsibility based and they do have decision making powers over things like finances so so they're thinking more ah oh, shall i claim my expenses or not is it the responsible thing to do if the church is struggling and um and so what i've noticed is that agency and responsibility they don't or that they don't necessarily correlate so um it's not that the more uh, responsibility you have, the more agency you have necessarily, because for those incumbents, their very responsibility constrains them in what um, in, in how they feel they can act. Whereas for those curates, um, they don't have that responsibility. So then they can exercise their rights, if you like, they can turn to somebody else and say, actually, I think I should be getting this, you know. They, so, so I'm interested in that relationship between agency and responsibility, or if you like, between power and responsibility or power and agency, where does power fit in to those things? Um, and I'm interested in your thoughts. I don't know if anyone particularly would like to, would like to kick off, uh, kick off on that. Um, I know Julius, you, you, you kind of spoke yeah. a bit. <laughs> As somebody who has experienced this in recent time of asking about internet, who is paying, what's mileage, and all of those things. Um, this comes from the place of different parishes, different dioceses do things differently. So we usually want to know what's happening and what we, if somebody's shortchanging us. You know, when things go bad for a long time, people become too careful. Uh, because I know some people who, who have been told, no, we can't pay that, but actually the diocese was expecting that to be paid. So, and, and, and it puts the curate in a difficult position, especially when you are having these issues with your training incumbent or the PCC. Then you might have to go to the IME and, be, and all those power issues start crippling up immediately. So it's a, it's a very difficult place to be. And uh, whether you would simply look away from such responsibility and be a good person and use your stipend for parish-based activities. So at that point, you also see yourself, should I be the agent of change to challenge um, difficult and ungodly acts that are going on in church? Or is it my responsibility also to do that? So at some point, it's almost like you have to uh, choose your battles. Should I report this ugly situation to the diocese or should I treat it as an in-house parish life activity? It's not an easy decision to make and um, <laughs> I won't comment for that, but sometimes you simply have to choose your battles. It's so unfortunate, but... Yeah, so there's something there about um, working out what your responsibilities are and where they lie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then... Um, decisions about whether you kind of step into those and, and, and take them on in a sense. Exactly, exactly. Like if things are not going right, is it my responsibility as a new curate to change it? Or should yeah. I call upon those who can make changes? And if I'm calling upon them, what kind of power are they bringing? Is it a soft power or a hard one that might destabilize things for me in parish ish yeah. kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, Mark, go for it. Um, some years ago, I think it was Charles Handy wrote a book called The Gods of Management, uh, where he talked about different institutional structures. And one of the conflicts I think I see in the church is um, we're not clear between us which structure we're working with. So part of us wants to think there are common rules for everyone in every situation until we find ourselves alongside somebody who's in a very unique situation. And actually I have to say, almost every clergy person I deal with is in a very unique situation. And so we want to help in this case or in that case. And so we find ourselves in one of his other kind of institutional structures, which is much more relational. Um, and then we find ourselves relating with uh, uh, often folk who have not thought perhaps very carefully about the church, who have expectations on us, which bring no structure whatsoever, but do bring God into the room in a way which is actually quite unreflective and actually means there's no structure within which either power is being exercised to us or by us. 
And so one of the things I think that I often observe is there almost isn't a common language to have conversations about the power that is being exercised over us, with us or by us. Um, and, and, and that's part of the reason I'm really glad that this conversation is taking place, because power isn't quite as simple as just being agency or responsibility. It's, it's a whole a networked understanding of where we are. And in fact, that changes our understanding of whether this is fair or that is fair. Um, so I'm not trying to say this is all terribly complex, we can't understand it. But I think actually reflecting on the context within which we're having the conversation can be really helpful. But I think Frankie's going to come in and be much more wise than me because I'm seeing her. <laughs> not, uh, not at all, Mark, but I, I just wanted to agree with you that actually I think it is really complex. And, and I would want to um, always attend to the circumstances in which I find myself and the, the manifestation of the body of Christ in which I am belonging. And, and that might be, you know, a cathedral, it might be as I am at the moment in two parishes um, and, and bring whatever sagacity, and I like the word sagacity because it's sort of, you know, you can chew the word, it's a good word to say, um, a, a sort of wisdom to, um, which is, which is hopefully a thoughtful sort of principled wisdom that draws on, you know, the theology we do, our life experience, um, our own sense of positionality in a situation. Um, and then to say, well, what are my dreams for this time that I am here? Um, what can I actually use my agency to move things forward? And how can I, how can I empower others or resist others if they're, if they're you know, well, how can I make good judgments in this situation to take the situation forward and and so that this place I will leave better than I found it and where people are owning and collaborating and working together towards particular goals which I might have identified as good ones but they need to be checked out and worked through so so it, it seems to me the exercise of power and how we're accountable to the people that are around us and how we discern what what how our agency is best used always as I was saying earlier checking our egos and making sure that you know we really are focused on service above self um, I think that that's where, where I've come to really that that it doesn't help me to think oh I'm a gendered priest, you know, I'm a woman in the Church of England, so therefore dot, 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 I'm going to be put upon or I'm going to use my power in particular sorts of ways or whatever, because I just, I, 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 I've, I've found that that's sort of dried up on me, really, that sort of uh, way of understanding power that takes me towards an identity politics, which doesn't, doesn't seem to help me anymore in the situation I find myself, but, you know, that's, that's just where I've, I've got to, really. Yeah, <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, just, I'd, I'd like to invite anyone who's um, watching and listening, if, if you have any questions and do put them in the chat. Um, oh, someone's already put one in there. But I just wanted to, to pick up on that. So, so that's, it's a very, is it then a very personal thing? So is this a kind of moving towards a culture that's, that's more about the kind of power with and trust and is that largely about personal formation, in effect, and, and individuals um, learning and growing and, and adapting their behaviour? Yes, can I just come in on trust? I, I think that we live in a world that is deeply distrustful and suspicious in all sorts of ways in, culture, in our culture. And, and I think one of the things that the church can really demonstrate is even though we're very different and we have all sorts of different senses of agency building trust between people is a, is a real vocation and it's not easy but I think that that's that feels to me something that that you know is is something that the church can at least attempt to do well um, building trust and building building a, a hermeneutic of trust so that we we assume trust rather than assume suspicion I, 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 yeah Mark, oh, and then Julius. Uh, oh, Julius, please go first. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Bishop. <laughs> the thing is, uh, I just want to point out that sometimes we should not think the other person has power because if I assume that my bishop has power over me, actually they might be thinking I am the one with the power. So, it, so I, I sometimes, 
it's good for us to not make assumptions of who has power. Of course, there might be ecclesial, legal, and spiritual powers, but sometimes in different situations and locations, power might move depending on the issue. Therefore, like uh, Francis has said, we should build on that level of trust that we are having conversations as brothers and sisters in Christ, rather than, oh, this person might be out to get me kind of idea. So I think on that, we sort of power moves. And sometimes the person that looks powerful might not actually have that power. I agree with that. Um, I think structurally, one of the problems we have in the Church of England is we lack what I call middle ground polity. So we kind of do the central well, synod is well organized, the House of Bishops meets and what have you. Well, whether we do it well, you can decide, but at least we put energy into it and it's regularly organized. Um, and I think we do parish level well, um, and sometimes we do diocesan level well, but there aren't the structures that mean that we actually are engaged sitting around a round table. Um, there are folk here from Chester Diocese and they can judge how well we're actually managing that. But one of the things I am looking to do in this diocese is to reduce the distance between the centre and the parish in order that we are genuinely in conversation. Because most people I meet actually want the best for the, the church, for, for others. Um, but, but when we become distant, we start either deifying or demonising, and that's not helpful. I noticed Katie Toppling put in the questions, who holds institutional power? I'm on my iPad, so I can't see it, Katie, but basically that was the question. I remember the Archbishop of Canterbury saying to me, what people don't realise is that all I am is an instrument of unity, which made me smile. I mean, it's very Archbishop Justin, he has that sense of humour. But I sometimes think the main power we have as bishops is convening, is getting people in the same place. Um, I don't know if that's helpful, but, but that's where I would start addressing some of these questions. Thank you. There's lots going on in the chat now. Um, we've kind of set off a bit of an explosion. There's one um, uh, for Julius. It says, if a white English ordinand were translated into the Church of Nigeria, as were you into the Church of England, do you think the same power disparities would be evident? Well, it, it might depend on the place they go to. In some places, may, they might actually be deified, oh, thinking that this expatriate has come to do something for us. In some places, they might be demonized in terms of linking them with uh, the British colonial uh, government or the oil companies that have destroyed a lot of part of uh, the River Rhine area. So it's not a clear answer, but the thing is that we welcome them and we give them good jollof rice for a welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anderson is asking, how do we understand when the words, by the power vested upon me by divine authority within the church, both by those who exercise and those who are at the receiving end. Can I have a go at that? <laughs> it's a tricky question. Thanks very much, Anderson. <laughs> um, I, the way I'm, I, I sort of begin to frame power is, is that actually all power comes from God and we participate in the reality of God. And insofar as we participate in God's reality, which is where love and power become synonymous, we, we become more real and we become more effective. I mean, this takes a lot of discernment and a lot of prayer and a lot of wisdom um, it, it, as much as we can bring to it. But it seems to me that power is a, a gift from God and it's a power that God wants us to use um, in service of God. Um, and that if we understand power as that which enables trust and love to grow amongst us in the body of Christ and in the world, then, then somehow we're framing it in a way that, that is um, positive and, and, and not op oppositional. Um, that love also obviously extends to those who are suffering and who have been abused. Um, and, and, and so therefore they, they need such people need to be our, our main, our first priority, it seems to me. But the service, I think holding together love and power as in God, something that is part of God's divine simplicity, I think is, 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 is a, for me, a helpful place to start. Thank you, Mark. 
I think it is helpful, but I, I don't want our niceness to let us off the hook. So just last night, um, Anderson, who's co-hosting this, was with me when I licensed two priests in the Diocese of Chester. Both of them knelt in front, well, actually stood in front of me at that point, and, and they promised before God to pay true and canonical obedience to the Lord Bishop of Chester in all things lawful, lawful and honest. And, and that's the standard uh, vow that's made by anybody coming into ordained ministry. I am deeply uncomfortable in that moment. I, I, I know why it's there, but actually uh, it, it looks like it gives me an extraordinary amount of power. Um, one of my questions building on what you're saying, Francis, is how the church um, assists and requires me and those like me to hold that power in a way which is godly and loving um, and to use it in the extreme where we need to around safeguarding or what have you, but not to let it go to our heads or, 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 or whatever it happens uh, to be. And I would come back and say that participation in God's love is, uh, uh, is, is the best way of understanding power. So you are there not as someone who is powerful, but as someone who is ultimately yes. as loving as you possibly can be in God <laughs> and that takes prayer and you know everything that any bishop would hopefully bring to that role yeah um, yeah, yeah on, on, on similar notes on the issue of curates uh, somebody has mentioned that we do not have employment rights and such other things and our life is almost left in the hands of our training incumbent and when things go bad, the IME2 officer, that's initial ministerial education two officer who handles you after you're ordained deacon. And I think that's, it's difficult. It's a, it's a real conversation that needs to be had uh, because I know a few curates who have moved. Some moved barely six weeks into ministry because what was promised is not what is being delivered. Some out of bullying and a lot of stressful situations. And some people are still in their curacy even though it's not going well, and they've made recourse to the diocesan officers about heading to the diocesan bishop uh, himself, yet nothing has been done. And this person is in a powerless situation. And such occasions, calling for that love and that power to be mixed together, calls for somebody who is willing to make themselves accountable. And also the issue of how do we empower people who feel powerless? also is a place of accountability to make yourself vulnerable. I know the office of the bishop is quite strong or the area, you know, whatever, but sometimes in order to help ourselves grow, we simply need to make ourselves vulnerable for the church to move. But because once we close the gates, then we have people standing outside of our castles and the church can move forward from there. We have a model, don't we, of Christ on the cross as the ultimate model of, of a vulnerable, of power in vulnerability. I mean, and it's, it's, it, there's, uh, I mean, the, the sort of, uh, that is a manifestation of power at the centre of our, our um, Christianity is, is so challenging, isn't it, to all of us in terms of our vulnerability and how we exercise our vulnerability and how we understand our self-sacrificial service um, for others. Um, it, 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 it just becomes so big and complex, doesn't it, theologically and, you know, in terms of how that gets unpacked in any particular circumstance. Uh, it's, it's, it's big. Thank you. Um, goodness, we are, there's so, there's so much in the chat and and um, I, have, I haven't even managed to get through to the, to read the end of it, but I will, I will read it all. Um, and we are just about out of time, but thank you so much for all those thoughts that we've, so some of the themes that I've been picking up are um, things to do with trust, building culture of trust, um, listening and understanding other people's perspectives, accountability and vulnerability, appropriate vulnerability as well, bringing people together and, and trying to, to um, reduce distance, um, personal uh, responses, uh, as well as structural responses. Um, and, and Frankie ended us there with, with the, the person of, of Jesus and, and talking about the, the love of God and, and representing that as well. Um, thank you there's that's a lot a lot to go away with a lot to to chew on and reflect on um and a lot uh, maybe to pick up on in in other uh, webinars in this series 
Um, so I think Mike is going to come back and, and talk and just mention a little bit more about that. But thank you. Um, before we do that, thank you so much to the panelists and thank you to Jenna as well. You've been absolutely brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so thank you to, to Liz, to Julius, to Francis, to Mark and to Jenna for all that you've taken us through today. As Liz said, I want to just finish by emphasising that this is the, the beginning of a conversation. We've had lots of stories, we've had lots of ideas, we've had lots of questions raised today, but we've not had the opportunity yet to, to drill really deeply into any of them. This is a beginning um, and we want to carry on. Whether you're delighted with what you heard today, whether it's left you with something that you want to pursue really hard, whether you you want to, to, to come back and, and criticize something that you've heard today. We hope that this uh, series of webinars will provide the space to go on doing that. If you have any suggestions or criticisms about the format, the way that we're running these things, please do get in touch with me. I'm Mike Higton. You can find my contact details on the University of Durham uh, website. Just search for Mike Higton. Um, uh, but I can tell you now that our um, next webinar, the one that's that's uh, coming up next, we will have uh, Katie Tupling, who will be speaking about the relationship between power and disability in the Church of England. That's going to be on Tuesday, the 7th of December. And at a different time, we're experimenting with different times to make it accessible to different people. It will be 5.30pm to 6.30pm. So Katie Tupling, Power and Disability in the Church of England um, will be our, our next webinar. Um, but thank you all for coming. I hope that you found something valuable to take away with you today. And thank you again to our presenters and our interpreter.